Why Deficits Stop Mattering In the 1980s, the link between deficits and inflation was broken, but the money printing never stopped. How did the ESF pull off this magic trick? Well, it is possible to print money without causing inflation. For example, if the government prints billions, and those billions disappeared overseas, there would be no inflation. This is exactly what happened in the 1980s, when a large part of the US currency went missing, disappearing into the hands of foreigners, and the supply of dollars in the US stopped growing, and inflation. This wasn't an accident since in 1981, administration officials started telling the entire world that deficits don't matter. They knew that billions of dollars were about to disappear overseas. This leads to two very important questions. Where did these disappearing dollars go and why did they leave the US? Iran-Contra and the Reagan Doctrine Finding the missing dollars is not hard. The New York Times reported in 1990 that Nicaragua was using a new currency. Against a background of hyperinflation, all Nicaraguans scrambled to convert their Cordobas into American currency. So why did the Nicaraguan Cordoba collapse in the 1980s? Well, John Stockwell gives us the answer by describing the CIA's bloody campaign to destabilize Nicaragua beginning in 1981, the year deficits stopped mattering. When the US doesn't like a government, they send in the CIA to tear apart the social and economic fabric of the country. In other words, creating terrible conditions. To destabilize Nicaragua, the US began funding this force called the Contras. And the Contras Contras, under U.S. direction, systematically blew up granaries, sawmills, bridges, government offices, schools, and health centers. One example of hard proof of the CIA's involvement in all this is the Sabotage Manual, which was a comic book style manual that encouraged Nicaraguans to hurl Molotov cocktails and engage in other forms of sabotage. The Contras also systematically assassinated religious workers, teachers, health workers, elected officials, and government administrators. To help with all this, the CIA provided an assassination manual to the Contras. It caused quite a stir when it surfaced in 1984. This was all part of Iran-Contra, when the United States armed and trained Honduras-based militants to topple the government of Nicaragua, even after Congress made it illegal. The Contras form of warfare was one of systematic and bloody human rights abuse, of murder, torture, mutilation, rape, arson, destruction, and kidnapping. The atrocities are well documented, and they were financed through the ESF. America was at war with with Nicaragua. Navy ships supervised the mining of harbors, while U.S. planes bombed the capital. And this bloody CIA campaign was part of the Reagan Doctrine, an effort to roll back communist regimes in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Nicaragua was just one of many destabilizations, all of which were bloody, horrifying affairs. These thousands of brutal CIA covert actions, which destabilized a third of the countries in the world, are what saved the dollar in the 1980s. That leaves only the question of how these disappearing dollars traveled from the United States to places like Nicaragua. Dollarizing the world. Dollarization is the process whereby the US dollar supplants a country's national currency as the medium of exchange. Many countries have an enormous quantity of dollars in circulation. Where did these greenbacks come from? Well, the most reasonable explanation is drug money laundering, which brings us to bulk currency smuggling, the primary method for expatriating drug proceeds from the United States. This dollar smuggling takes place through air cargo, outbound freighter, and the same vehicles used to smuggle cocaine in. When you add together the cash smuggled out of America by Mexican, South American, and Canadian drug dealers, you realize that the total bulk currency smuggling is huge. This bulk currency smuggling took off in the 80s as a result of an intensifying crackdown on money laundering by banks who were under threat of heavy fines from federal authorities. This campaign against money laundering explains the huge outflow of dollars to the rest of the world. By tightening currency restrictions, the Treasury forced launderers to resort to bulk currency shipments. These controls on bank accounts and wire transfers have grown ever stricter, forcing more and more cash out of the United States. And all these outgoing laundered greenbacks dollarized the world. In Afghanistan right now, the Afghani and the dollar are pretty much interchangeable. The illicit trade in opium has single-handedly introduced the dollar to the region. Meanwhile, the American coca trade has led to mass addiction and the vicious dollarization of Latin America. In 1986, as a result of Iran-Contra, it came to light that the U.S. government was directly developing massive cartel infrastructure in Central America. Thousands of tons of cocaine were brought into the U.S., and the money was used to introduce the dollar to the entire Latin America in our region. The US dollar is now the standard currency for El Salvador and Panama, and it is simply the unofficial de facto tender in the rest of the region. That's right, nearly every country in the Americas involved in producing, transporting, and using cocaine
Spain is using the US dollar as a medium for exchange. Treasury profits from the war on drugs. The huge inflow of narcotics during the 80s did more than just dollarize the world. It also delivered massive profits to the Treasury and the ESF. The government began confiscating enormous quantities of property and cash, and the proceeds were funneled directly into the US Treasury. This was all part of the government's drug forfeiture program, which was radically expanded in the 80s. This innovative effort gave the US Treasury title to any property used in a drug transaction. Federal law now grants the government extremely wide license in forfeiture cases. We've gotten to the point where virtually anything can be seized if it has substantial connection to drug trafficking. And since the Justice Department has budget targets it must meet, federal undercover agents and informants are schooled in the financial importance of arranging a drug sale on or near valuable real estate so that the entire track can be seized through the government's forfeiture program. Informants are often rewarded with a percentage of the assets they deliver this way. Thus, the family home is fair game for forfeiture if a relative or friend were to use it unlawfully. For example, the government took away the home of a New Jersey woman under the claim it was purchased with drug profits, but the house was actually bought three years before the drug offenses. The forfeiture situation is totally out of control. It has become a dysfunctional policy where efficiency is measured by the amount of money seized rather than the impact on drug trafficking. Narcotics units prefer seizing cash rather than confiscating drugs and reducing the supply reaching the streets. Those dogs you see at the border aren't looking for drugs. They are currency sniffing dogs. It is important to note that the more drugs come into the US, the more the treasury profits. Okay, let's look at the next piece of the puzzle, which involves the largest banking scandal you've never heard of. ECCI, the dirtiest bank of them all. Bank fraud cases are usually dry, tedious affairs, not this one. Nothing in the history of modern financial scandals rivaled the unfolding saga of the Bank of Credit and Commerce International. We never had a single scandal involve so much money, so many nations, and so many prominent people. It was the largest corporate criminal enterprise ever, the biggest Ponzi scheme, the most pervasive money laundering operation ever created for the likes of Saddam Hussein and Colombian drug barons. BBCI was more than just a criminal bank. It had a clandestine division called the Black Network, which functioned as a global intelligence operation and a mafia-like enforcement squad. BBCI was used to funnel money during Iran-Contra. The bank also bribed public officials around the world and was protected by the Justice Department, which tried to derail any investigation. It was in the early 1980s when deficits stopped mattering that the Black Network began running its own drugs, weapons, and currency deals. Senior bankers feared that they would be physically maimed, even killed, if they were found talking about the BBCI's activities. It was a really nasty operation, and an integral part of the ESF's global dollar Ponzi scheme. The HIV equals AIDS fraud, the enormous quantities of heroin and cocaine flooding the United States, quickly led to a deadly drug epidemic. By the mid-80s, the ESF's drug smuggling operation was so successful that kids were buying cocaine with their lunch money. The government's role in sparking this deadly epidemic has been reported on many times. For example, Gary Webb, an investigative reporter who won more than 30 journalism awards, including a Pulitzer Prize, in 1996 wrote a series of stories in entitled Dark Alliance. Based on extensive research and backed by a mountain of evidence, Dark Alliance described how the U.S. government was, in fact, involved in dumping cocaine into California, sparking the most destructive drug epidemic in American history. Now, heroin and cocaine are not healthy things, so if you start distributing tons of them into a country, hundreds of thousands of people will start to die. This is what happened in the 80s, when the ESF's flood of drugs led to a deadly epidemic in the drug-using community. People were dying because their immune systems were breaking down. In 1982, it was clear that this AIDS epidemic was not caused by an infectious disease. There was no evidence that the condition was spreading from person to person, and the general public didn't need to fear an epidemic. The condition did not spread to other family members, hospital workers, or researchers. Unless your life was filled with frequent sex and frequent drug use, you were in absolutely no danger of dying from AIDS. This AIDS epidemic became a threat to the ESF, who was in the process of piping as many tons of drugs into the U.S as it could. This is because Congress came under enormous pressure to do something because of the hundreds of thousands that were dying. Any crackdown on the true causes of the epidemic, especially drug use, would have been a problem. The ESF fixed the situation by turning to its Wurlitzer and inventing another cause for AIDS, the HIV virus. We have a long way to go in the fight against HIV. 
The virus that causes AIDS. 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 Thanks to the HIV equals AIDS fraud, the government handed out free needles instead of cracking down on drug use. To truly understand the facts about AIDS, watch the documentary HIV equals AIDS, Fact or Fraud. AIDS has failed to spread into the female population also. When the U.S. Army began testing new recruits for HIV in 1984, they discovered an amazing fact. HIV infection was evenly spread between males and females 50-50, and it's remained that way since then. It should follow that AIDS would be 50% male and 50% female, yet 9 out of every 10 people who develop AIDS continue to be male. This could explain why drug use is more related to AIDS than HIV infection. In the U.S., males use over 80% of all hard psychoactive drugs. AIDS is caused by recreational drug use, and injected drugs like heroin and cocaine are the direct cause of AIDS in 9 out of 10 cases. The original papers upon which the HIV equals AIDS myth was based were fabricated, and there aren't 26 million Africans dying of AIDS. That is another myth. The mighty Wurlitzer plays on. The elaborate scheme to save the dollar would not have been possible without the media's cooperation. The ESS propaganda network allowed it to inject Americans with a synthetic reality, like the HIV equals AIDS myth. But the Wurlitzer did much more than that, as demonstrated by what happened when Dark Alliance was published. The initial reaction to Gary Webb's Dark Alliance was dead silence. In other words, a total media blackout. You see, if the Time publishes an article on BBCI and the rest of the nation's editors decide to ignore the story, it quickly withers and dies like a light-starved plant. Nothing sells like scandal, so when a story like BBCI is ignored, it's unnatural. Anyhow, Dark Alliance got the silence treatment big time. No one would touch it. But no one had counted on the enormous popularity of the website. Information that goes viral on the internet is perhaps the Wurlitzer's only weakness, so Dark Alliance developed a political momentum all on its own, and it happened despite a virtual news blackout from major media. Ultimately, public pressure forced the national newspapers into the fray, and when they spoke, they spoke in unison. The official conclusion reached by the Washington Post, the New York Times, and the Los Angeles Times was there's no story here. Dark Alliance was flawed. The way the mainstream press responded to the series was later described as one of the most venomous and factually insane assaults in living memory. Apparently, CNN helps the CIA redefine reality. Despite all the furor, the facts of a story never changed except to become more damning. But the perception of them did, and that's all that really mattered. Once a story becomes discredited, the rest of the media shies away from it, and it becomes consigned to the dustbin of history as an internet conspiracy theory. This is how undesired stories are brutally assaulted and killed. It works pretty damn well, too. You see, the media is free to report on all the sex scandals it wants, but when it comes to the real down and dirty stuff, that's where we see the limits of our freedom. In today's media environment, such stories are not even open for discussion. Gary Webb later died of two gunshot wounds to the head. It was ruled a suicide. The super dollar. Although the ESF managed to print money without causing inflation by dollarizing the rest of the world, it still was left with an enormous pool of greenbacks whose return into the US could collapse the dollar. It needed some way to neutralize this threat and slow the return of these foreign dollars. This brings us to the super dollar also known as a super note, another massive, multi-decade, ongoing fraud that no one has heard of. The super note is a counterfeit $100 bill that looks exactly like the real thing. Here's why the super note is super. It contains every security feature of the real bill. It is printed on intaglio presses that only governments have access to. It is made with rag cotton paper. It contains tiny red and blue fibers. It has an embedded plastic strip, etc. There have been 19 versions so far. The super notes are of such high quality and are updated so frequently that they could only be produced by a U.S. government agency such as the ESF. After first being detected in 1989, the super dollar has spread, and soon countries like Russia were filled with high quality fakes. At first Iran and Syria were blamed, then criminal gangs in Russia or China, finally North Korea. However, this is unlikely. These notes go way beyond what normal counterfeiters are able to do. Also, super notes appear to have been produced in quantities less than what it would cost cost to acquire the sophisticated machinery needed to make them. Whoever's doing it is apparently operating at a loss. There's more. Even though the counterfeiters have mastered infrared-sensitive 
security inks. The notes are produced in such a way that they have little chance of going undetected in America. In other words, the super sophisticated counterfeiters could make absolutely untraceable notes if they wanted to, but they don't. They deliberately produce them in a way that can be tracked by no one except the US government and other central banks. This phony 100 bill is not a fake anymore. It's an illegal parallel print of a genuine note. The super note serves two purposes. One, it increases ESF profits. Two, it helps to negate the threat posed by dollars in the rest of the world. Not only do super dollars never come back from abroad, they also make foreigners nervous about bringing their real dollars back to the US in case they turn out to be fake. Next, we need to discuss what would happen if the incoming flow of drugs were to dry up. First, the outgoing laundered dollars would be gone, leaving only the incoming dollars from abroad. Second, there would be no more profits from the war on drugs, which would mean a lot more printed money, and this would very quickly lead to problems for the ESF. I mention this because the incoming flow of drugs has been interrupted once before. Breakdown in the flow of heroin. In 1979, when the dollar was collapsing, the ESF's capital position was negative, and all hope for the dollar seemed lost. The CIA began its biggest covert operation ever. I supporting Osama bin Laden and other guerrilla fighters in Afghanistan. An integral part of the CIA's intervention was a huge increase in the production of opium and heroin, which have continued rising ever since. One of the key architects of all this was George W. Bush Sr. Anyhow, the heroin trafficking was handled by BBCI, up until its collapse in 1991, after which it was handled by a terrorist organization known as Al-Qaeda. And something went terribly wrong for the ESF Al-Qaeda heroin operation in 2001. You see, in the fall of 2000, the Taliban announced a total ban on the cultivation of opium. Taliban militia then went out and burned heroin labs and drugs. The ban was a success. Of course, the world refused to recognize this good deed. In fact, the US hit Afghanistan with sanctions. Despite this, the betting was the ban was going to hold up. Heroin stocks were going down and they wouldn't be replaced. The Taliban's eradication of poppies was probably the most dramatic event in the history of illegal drug markets. There was no chance that opium from other sources could compensate compensate for the loss, and by June opium had gone up five to seven times in price. Now you remember what happens when the flow of drugs gets interrupted, right? Well as seen on the Fed's website, things started to get really interesting around the middle of 2001. Now at the beginning of the year everything was normal, the growth of currency was in single digits. But as July came around, that changed. By August, the amount of dollars in circulation was soaring. The increase in currency in circulation from June to August 2001 was the largest in recorded history. Deficits were about to start mattering again. But then, in September 2001, 9-11 happened. One skyscraper collapsed. Then a second skyscraper collapsed. Finally, a third skyscraper, World Trade Center 7, collapsed. No one has really explained why this third skyscraper collapsed. Also unexplained is why molten steel was found weeks after 9-11 at ground zero. This is how expensive day one. Oh, it's unbelievable. And this is six weeks later. It's probably 1,500 degrees. Eight weeks later, we still got fires burning. At one point, I think there were about 2,800 degrees. There were fires of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit below the ground. Finally, no one has explained why scientists around the world are finding nanothermite, a military-grade explosive in the dust from 9-11. This is a peer-reviewed paper published in a scientific journal for those of you who know what that means. The flow of heroin is restored. September 11 solved the ESF's heroin problem. By October, heroin was flooding into the West. Wholesale prices dropped, and farmers went back to growing poppies. By the next year, opium production was back where it was supposed to be. However, the invasion did more than just restore Afghan poppy production. It took it to a whole new level. Most of this increase came from Helmand province. And guess who controls this Helmand province? You know, they have these opium fields, and we are tolerating it. We are tolerating the cultivation of the opium. Here you have one of the best fighting forces in the world ever mounted. Uh, and in a sense, uh, you're watching as uh, this opium is being grown. I Afghanistan now produces 93% of the world's opium, and it is being grown under the protection of U.S. troops. Predictably, this skyrocketing production has had deadly domestic implications. By 2006, Afghan heroin was potent, cheap, and pouring into the U.S., causing a surge in heroin-related deaths. 
and the problem has continued to grow as heroin has roared back to life in America, killing more and more people across the U.S. Also predictably, Afghanistan got hit by an AIDS epidemic. Although the country used to have negligible rates of AIDS, the U.S. then invaded and turned it into the largest producer of heroin in the world, and now AIDS is killing thousands. The structure of a Ponzi scheme. Ponzi schemes require two levels of deception. One aimed at those who aren't aware anything is wrong, and another aimed at those who know there's fraud. Take Bernard Madoff's auditor, for example, who now faces 114 years in prison. Turns out David Freiling did not know about the Ponzi scheme, and even invested all his family's money with Madoff. Now that's what you call a sucker. There were a large number of people who knew Bernie Madoff was cheating. In fact, the participation of these people was essential for the Ponzi scheme to work. However, no one gets involved with a fraud if they know it's a Ponzi scheme. That's why Bernie Madoff deceived them about what they were involved in, inventing a fake or imaginary fraud. All Ponzi schemes require people tricked into getting involved by these fictitious conspiracy theories, which have several defining characteristics. They are elitist. This is so the participants feel special and don't ask too many awkward questions. They are relatively benign. This is so the suckers don't understand the risks they are taking. They are open-ended because no one would knowingly work for a Ponzi scheme. They are run by masterminds whose strange actions are part of some imaginary master plan. Finally, because they aren't real, they are easily disproved, which is incredibly useful in ridiculing those warning of fraud. Since the ESF is running a giant dollar Ponzi scheme, it is not surprising that there are so many conspiracy theories today. Just because there are high-profile journalists who believe they are part of a new world order doesn't make it true. They are fools who know not what they do. The Bad Banker Deception Whenever someone stumbles upon the massive financial fraud going on, they often start believing that a group of bankers is responsible. According to this conspiracy theory, it all began with the Fed, when several of the world's richest bankers got together on Jekyll Island and conspired to destroy the dollar. One of those bankers, Frank Vanderlip, is my great-grandfather, which is why I know what really happened. The reality is that Frank Vanderlip was not responsible for fiat money. In fact, he campaigned quite hard against it. You see, although the secret Jekyll Island meeting did happen. What is never mentioned is that the Treasury radically redesigned the bill, making the dollar a fiat currency backed by the taxing authority of the government. As bad as Wall Street wanted a central bank, it did not want it bad enough to start the government on its way to the issuance of fiat money. So Frank Van Lip was not alone in opposing the bill. Virtually all bankers waged an intense campaign against the Federal Reserve Act. They were in a panic. The proposal constituted an unprecedented level of government interference in the most sensitive area of the capitalist economy. The intense opposition of bankers isn't surprising since there is no case in all of history where a nation has started issuing fiat money that has not resulted in the complete breakdown of the financial system of that country. Frank Vanderlip did manage to revise the most objectable parts of the bill, helping delay the dollar's destruction. He also was not a pawn in a global conspiracy. When Frank Vanderlip was employed as a journalist, he was a type of crusading newsman that has now disappeared. And after retiring from Citibank, Frank Vandalip investigated corruption in President Warren Harding's administration. His actions were instrumental in exposing the T-Dome scandal, which, before Watergate, was regarded as the greatest and most sensational scandal in the history of American politics. He did this at huge expense and at some risk to his life. Frank Vandalip was not the type of man who would be involved in a sinister conspiracy. The bad banker deception has being the Treasury's most useful bit of propaganda. The Federal Reserve Act was passed to take control of the currency away from evil private bankers. Then, in 1934, the ESF was created to give the Treasury the power and the weapon with which to protect itself against privately owned banks. And since then, the Treasury's interference in banking has only grown. Examples of this include creating mortgage securitization, then through the RTC, the subprime market, and the insane models now used by rating agencies. And every crisis has been blamed on bankers. What's so tragic about all this is that the bad banking argument is then used to grab even more power. This is how our financial system has become corrupted. Goldman Sachs used to be an ethical firm that didn't break the law. But then Robert Rubin became Treasury Secretary. And Goldman Sachs became the abomination we know today. The ESF's dollar fraud is falling apart. The Exchange Stabilization Fund's Ponzi scheme was always doomed to collapse. 
and right now the day of reckoning is at hand. The desperation of the financial frauds used to prop up the dollar are evidence of this. As a result of decades of financial insanity, we've gotten to the point where the FDIC is liquidating banks that have no assets left in them whatsoever. To keep the financial system together, the Fed has been selling massive quantities of options. And when interest rates head up, the derivative market will go up in smoke. A food shortage has sent prices soaring, crushing the U.S. consumer sector and leading to riots around the world. U.S.-backed dictators are being overthrown, and the death of Osama bin Laden was not within the ESF's plans. Problems are reaching the level where nothing can hide them. The U.S. economy is dying, and America's infrastructure is crumbling. Poverty rates are soaring. Nearly half of Detroit can't read. There are places in the U.S. that the police no longer respond to 911 calls, and the murder rate in Flint, Michigan is even worse than Baghdad. America is becoming a third world country. To keep things going just a few more months, America's highways, ports, and even parking meters are being auctioned off. The ESF is stripping the last meat off the bone and there's nothing left. Smart people have seen the writing on the wall and are turning whistleblower. Interestingly, in this category is former chairman Alan Greenspan. A lot of that stuff was just plain fraud. It was rampant fraud in a lot of what was going on in these markets to get far higher levels of enforcement of fraud statutes. Existing ones, I'm not even talking about new ones. Things were being done which were certainly illegal and clearly criminal in certain cases. Really, Greenspan? Only now do you mention that there's rampant, unprosecuted fraud? The amount of people hurt by the ESF's desperate Ponzi scheme defies comprehension. And as the dollar collapses, all the ESF's activities will be revealed to the world. People are not in a forgiving mood when a Ponzi scheme collapses, and there is a hunt for anyone connected to the crime. Ignorance is not an accepted excuse. Those involved in ESF ESF frauds don't have a clue what's ahead for them, and everyone is about to be reminded that there is no such thing as magic. Donations appreciated. It has taken an enormous amount of time and effort to make these five videos, so if you enjoyed them, please don't hesitate to donate. Thank you.